All right, so let's get started with um, with the the continuing on from last week. Um, so, all right. <clears throat> so last week we talked about. Um, hang on. Um, hold on. There we go. So, um, yeah, last week we were talking about, uh, this, this whole idea of these like cabinets of curiosities and, um, uh, what that looks like and how they, most of them have become, uh, natural history museums. Um, also, if you have questions or whatever, just like uh, cut me off or um, or whatever, or ask it in the chat, and I'll see it pop up, and we can pause to answer the questions as they roll in. Um, and so we talked about you know this stuff, and then we talked about the great chain of being and and Linnaeus and and how he was wrong, but he was describing like plants with like um, sex organs and and likening them to and analogizing them to like our own sex organs, um, and how he kind of grouped these things. But then, um, it didn't really work out. Right. And so along comes Cuvier who also didn't quite get it, but said, maybe we need to reconsider the way that we're thinking about these species and reconsider the order. And, um, <clears throat> the great chain is not really viable. And he said stuff about extinction is one of the first people to talk about catastrophes and and how animals just they go extinct right and uh and 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 this was really important and um influential for darwin um but cuvier wasn't quite there as far as darwin had gone um and so he said that creatures go extinct but they don't evolve and i believe this is where we left off so um this all presented kind of um, a, a scientific uh, problem. Namely that if creation was perfect, right, um, and things didn't evolve, why would they go extinct? What is the point of this, right? Fossils are kind of complicating the, the problem. So along comes Darwin into this really unknown field, um, this unknown situation. And he uh, hitched a ride on um, the HMS Beagle, which was uh, circumnavigating the, the world's oceans, um, a boat of, of, you know, essentially colonizers from the United Kingdom. And, and this was the journey that they took um, around the tip of South America of course, stopping in the Galapagos Islands. We'll get, we'll talk more about that in a second. Continuing on across the Pacific through um, Australia and the Indian Ocean, stopping at the Cape of Good Hope, crossing the Atlantic again to South America on the current, and then riding the currents home to Great Britain. Um, and there's a question here, which I'm wondering if anybody wants to take a guess about what Darwin was reading during this long trip. And I'll give you a hint. The You can just say the author or even like the subject matter. We've talked about both the author and the subject matter of what Darwin was reading already in this class. Any thoughts? Take a guess. Was it the book on uniformitarianism? It was, yeah. I don't know who said that because I can't see anyone, but um, good job. <laughs> it was the it was Lyle's book on uniformitarianism. Um, as Sarah also said in the chat, awesome job. Um, so he was reading about uniformitarianism, um, specifically the uniformitarian view of geology. Um, so uniformitarianism, right, says that 
<clears throat> these things happened a long time ago um, and they're the same processes that are happening now and so that means that they were happening very slowly in our perception in a human lifespan happening very slowly and so Darwin was thinking maybe this idea of like a slow uniformitarianism also applies to living things and uh, we watched this video uh, during last class right um, about his voyage on the Beagle and then when he came home and had to deal with kind of a hostile um, scientific community and, and government really that was still really deeply wedded to the idea of the great chain and God and um, these religious ideas of uh, species and everything. But here are some of the observations that Darwin made that are consistent with an old, slowly changing dynamic for Earth with the possibility of biological change over time. So one of the first things that he found was fossils of animals and species that you might find in the ocean, okay, so marine fossils, at the top of the Andes Mountains. So an enormously tall mountain chain off the coast, of, or not off the coast, but um, just sort of near the west coast of South America. Um, he's finding ocean, fossils of ocean species. Um, he also found fossils which resembled organisms that were uh, now present locally, right? not to other fossil forms in different lanes. So he found fossils that were similar to a bird, but that bird was no longer alive, but looked very similar to that bird, suggesting that maybe it was an older, kind of outdated model version of that bird, right? Bird 1.0 instead of bird 2.0 by the time that Darwin got there. So he's finding these similar fossils, but the, the species are extinct. Um, here's a great example um, of kind of a proto capybara and then, you know, current capybara. Um, and I'm trying to read what this is. So it's Toxodon platensis, which Darwin was surmising was kind of the, the ancient um, predecessor to, her, to the current very cute um, capybara. And... Let's see. I'm sorry. Uh, and then finally, that takes us to the Galapagos. So when Darwin arrived in the Galapagos, um, <clears throat> there were only a few animals that actually even lived there at all. Um, these were newly formed, relatively newly formed volcanic islands, not a lot of vegetation growth yet. Um, and he found specifically, right, um, he's famous for these uh, Galapagos Darwin's finches. We call them Darwin's finches now. <laughs> um, so Darwin's finches basically were, these animals were really similar on the different islands of the Galapagos, but not identical. But they all had a similar species that lived on the South African, uh, South American mainland, which suggested that at some point, right, in history, that species flew to the Galapagos Island, ended up staying there, and then, magic word, evolved into a slightly different species. So you can see that there were four species of finch that Darwin discovered on the four different Galapagos Islands, and they all had different, slightly different features. So some finches had very narrow, pointy beaks, presumably for obtaining food from small crevices and small, um, small uh, cracks maybe in rocks and, and, and whatever vegetation was there, um, getting little seeds out of those. Then on some other islands, perhaps with different vegetation or different rock forms or different geography, there were finches with gigantic wide beaks that were used to crush nuts and other things, right, to kind of um, allow that finch to eat. So the finches, while they all were very, very similar, um, had developed slightly different um, characteristics to adapt to their local environments on each of the different islands. 
So the combination of these three observations raised a lot of questions for what uh, Darwin initially called a special creation and then later abandoned for the word evolution. Um, and the fundamental question that he was asking was, if the Earth is really old and changing slowly, again, gleaning these insights from uniformitarian geology, he's believing, he's, he's trusting the science with uniformitarianism and geology, and he's saying, if the Earth really is old and changing, just like the uniformitarianists say, then what about the creatures that live in the world and are adapted to that slowly changing world, right? There are patterns across biodiversity, geographic, anatomical pattern, and Darwin is asking, do they indicate the creator's grand plan or is it something else? Turns out it was something else. Um, so he revisited this taxonomy, right? He revisited Linnaeus's taxonomy and he saw that um, these shared traits, right, that's grouping some of these species together, were they part of God's plan? Were they part of creation? Or were they indicative of something else going on? Okay, and Darwin is uh, observing and noting that naturalists, in his book Origin of the Species, right, his most famous, one of the most famous books ever in the history of science, I would argue, Darwin's Origin of Species, He's arguing that naturalists try to arrange these species and the genera and the families in each class on what's called the natural system, but what is this system, right? And what is meant by it? And so this brings us to um, defining two different types of traits that species possess. The first is analogous traits. So analogous traits, okay, suggest that um, all of these species live in a similar environment. And in this case, right, the analogous trait is a wing. And in this case, that environment is that these species fly in the air. But these species are all different, okay, and didn't evolve with each other. They're not evolved from the same common ancestor. They just developed this form to adapt to an environment, but the form is independent of the origin of the structure, right? So we can see, for example, a bat wing, very different than a mosquito wing, okay? Which is very different from um, this, which looks to me like a dinosaur um, and or perhaps a bird, okay? So these three wings are all wings, but they're all wings for different reasons or they're all wings on different species with different origins. So these are what we call analogous traits. They are traits that adapt to the same environment on unrelated sort of species. And Darwin saw these, um, and he said in Origin of the Species that such expressions as that famous one of Linnaeus and which we often meet with in more or less concealed form, that the characters do not make the genus, but that the genus gives the characters seem to imply that something more is included in our classification. It's not just that these species all have wings, and that's what makes them the same, okay? Darwin is arguing that species actually can trace the, their origins and their evolutionary ancestors to common homologous traits, which um, we'll get to in a second, but argues that instead of it being this nested thing where these are all mammals because they have something in, in common that God gave them or um, digited limbs, tetrapods that God gave them all limbs, instead they branched off of a tree. And Darwin's, uh, this branching, right, is the fundamental idea behind natural selection and evolution. So instead of man and mouse being related simply because they're mammals and, and God made them this way, they actually evolved from a common ancestor. And that common ancestor would have resided at the branch in the tree. So all species can trace their relationships with other species to a common branch in the tree. And here's actually some pictures from Darwin's notebook where he's drawing these branches, right? And this is the first time when anyone, 
that, uh, you know, has written these things down in the global north, um, in the sort of institution of science, that these branches are actually can describe all species um, on earth. And so Darwin realized that evolution really means fundamentally common descent. That the reason I have a thumb and um, monkeys have a thumb is because we have a common ancestor. The reason I have a digited limb and my dog has a digited limb is because we have a common ancestor that had a digited limb. This is not the same as analogous traits where I have a wing and someone else has a wing, but we can't trace the origin of that wing back to a common ancestor that had a wing. So there's a difference and I'll get to that in a second. So this type of thing is called an evolutionary tree or a phylogeny. Okay, And a phylogeny is just the fancy scientific word for um, an evolutionary tree. And so this is actually just a really like revolutionary and fundamental restructuring of the field of biology and our understanding of the natural world. Um, and it explained a lot of things. For example, why should similar bones have been created in the formation of the wing and the leg of the bat used as they are for such totally different purposes, right? And so the reason is because these are homologous traits. They're forms that are adapted to different environments but have the same origins. The same origin. So, you know, my hand and my cat or my dog's paw are homologous traits. They do different functions, they've adapted to different things, but they have a common ancestor that had a limb like this. Same goes for the fin of a whale, actually. So the fin of a whale is very different than the fin of a fish. The fin of a whale has essentially a hand inside of it. If you look inside of the fin of a whale, it looks like a human hand, just restructured. So this is a homologous trait. Same with a bat wing. These fingers here, which form parts of the wing, or analogous to, or homologous to, sorry, um, the, the digits on a cat and the digits on a human and even the digits on a whale. Okay, so these homologous traits are different than analogous traits. Okay, here is the, the, to remind you what analogous traits are, we have sharks, ichthyosaurs, and porpoises all have um, rear fins, tails adapted to swim in the water. But sharks have a common ancestor that is a fish. Ichthyosaurs have a common ancestor that was actually a reptile on the land, which went back into the water to swim. And porpoises have a common ancestor, which was a mammal on the land, which also went back in the water to swim for whatever reason. Right? So this is how we know that whales which are mammals, have a common ancestor which lived on land with us, with our common ancestor. So our common ancestor lived on the land. And then at some point, it diverged, the tree branched. Some of them went back in the water and slowly over time evolved into whales, and some of them stayed on land and slowly evolved over time into humans. And yet we have a sim similar common ancestor that has kind of a digited hand. Does this make, is this making sense kind of to people? Okay, great. Again, analogous traits, <clears throat> the wings, a great example. These similarities come about through what we call convergent evolution. So convergent evolution is when the common ancestors are different, but the traits actually become the same. So um, bats here and uh, mosquitoes or, or bees here have wings, right? But their common ancestors are very different on the tree. It just so happens that they've kind of converged up here to having wings because they live in a similar environment and they've adapted to that. They have analogous traits. So they don't have homologous traits, they have analogous traits. Eyes 
can be both analogous and homologous. So octopi, humans, and flies all have eyes, but their eyes are very different structurally. And that's because they have different uh, common ancestors that had eyes. So these are analogous traits. They developed eyes for the same reason we developed eyes to see things, but octopus eyes are very different than human eyes, which are very different than, um, for example, on a fly, eyes on a fly, which look creepy as hell. Honestly, the, the octopus eye looks really cute though. So, <laughs> but vertebrates, all do have a common ancestor which had an eye. So our eye is structurally similar to the eye in um, gorillas, in dogs, in birds even, um, in what looks like a cheetah or a leopard, um, et cetera, et cetera, right? So we can go and look here and all of these eyes have a common ancestor. They have, they're, they're very similarly structured and so these are what we call homologous traits. They're, they're eyes that then change slowly over time to adapt to different environments, but they have a similar internal structure. Um, and the same basic structure of an eye that was shared by a common ancestor. I know I'm beating a little bit this horse dead, but um, I really want to kind of make sure we understand the difference between homologous and analogous. So, Homologous traits are due to, due to common descent, right? For example, all of these animals are mammals, and that's because they have a common ancestor that's a mammal. And so they developed homologous traits accordingly. All of these animals have fins, um, but they don't have the same immediate common ancestor. These two do, but the fish, right, does not. It has a different common ancestor down here that did not have a fin. So the fins developed later. In fact, deers and dolphins have a more common ancestor, right, than dolphins and seals, right, which their common ancestor is back here, despite dolphins and seals having fins and deers not having fins, and dogs, for example, not having fins. Okay, so that's the difference between analogous and homologous. Homologous traits are especially um, kind of easy to spot when they become rudimentary or vestigial, vestigial, which means they have no more functional use, but they're still there because of common ancestors. For example, whales have hips. These hips don't lie, and whales have them. They're useless, totally useless, and in fact, they're almost totally disconnected from the rest of the skeleton at this point but they are still there. Whales have a femur and a pelvis, but no, no legs. So they just have this like hip floating around. Um, this is known as a vestigial trait. Humans have appendices. We don't use our appendix. It's a vestigial trait. It's there because of a common ancestor. We no longer need it. it no longer does anything for us useful necessarily, um, but it hasn't evolved to a point where it no longer exists. So vestigial traits, vestigial or rudimentary traits, really um, show us that um, um, show us that uh, that these homologous, this idea of homologous traits, that the origin, um, that the the common ancestor and uh, the origin of species really is real. Um, if we take this back all the way to our most basic cellular function. The ultimate homologous trait, right? The ultimate homologous trait is our DNA. So DNA contains genes, genes which are just segments um, for the pro that produce proteins, and the proteins then tell our brains and our bodies and, and everything to do certain functions, right? Um, and this genetic code is the same, essentially, the genome, right, contains the same components of DNA among all species, 
on the entire planet, all species contain uh, DNA. And they, they're only, you know, a certain, they're a finite number of genetic codes and sequences and um, enzymes or amino acids that exist in the world. So all species have different combinations of these things, right, to produce slightly different chains, which then create very different looking organisms. But fundamentally, at its most basic level, all life on Earth, the homologous trait that all life on Earth shares is DNA, these base pairs. You can think of it as like the ultimate homologous trait. So really, then, fundamentally, evolution unites all of life. There is no hierarchy. There is no God above man, above plants, above rocks. Life is life, linked by the essential homologous trait of its DNA. And when you actually look at the DNA differences among species, there is actually a remarkable amount of DNA shared between all species. In fact, we know that like humans and chimpanzees, for example, and bonobos uh, share about 96% of their DNA. It's a huge amount. But humans and a banana, a banana, share 50% of their DNA. So 50% of your human DNA is the exact same DNA as in a banana. So that's why it's the ultimate homologous trait. We share 50% of all of our DNA with a freaking banana. I love bananas, don't get me wrong, but you know, I'm smarter than a banana. So how did we get to this point? The only way, really, that we can understand this is by understanding evolution as being a thing. And it's really almost poetic in a way, right? Like evolution is this cool thing which unites everyone. And so clearly um, colonizing Europe, the Europe, the colonizers hated this idea. Um, it's too, it's very egalitarian. You know, it's, it's just unacceptable, unacceptable. So there was a lot of resistance to this, um, and like still is honestly, which is why I'm teaching it. Right. Um, it, it, it was a very, uh, um, <laughs> sorry, I just looked at the chat. Um, I'm glad I made you laugh, uh, Mila, and, um, I'm laughing at the jokes about bananas. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anyway, um, if you eat a banana, I, I'm not going to say that that's 50% cannibalism, but maybe. <laughs> it's also, but it's also why, for example, um, we can test pharmaceutical drugs, for example, in mice. They have share 85% of our DNA. So um, if whatever we're doing, whatever we're testing, is affecting that portion of the DNA, the DNA code, then we can use uh, mice or, or other uh, species to um, serve as a proxy for, for humans. Oops. Um, oh my gosh. Ugh. So here's what the phylogeny or the family tree, right, or the evolutionary tree looks like for all 2.3 million organisms on the planet. We all have a common ancestor and the link with that common ancestor is DNA. We've diverged billions and billions of times. There are groups now, fungi and metazoa, which includes animals and plants and all that, and bacteria and amoebas and all kinds of crazy things, archaea, right? But if you go back all the way to the beginning, four million years ago, 
3.85 million years ago. There is a common ancestor that links us all, um, and it, ha it has contains this one homologous trait, which is DNA. It's kind of beautiful, really. I think it's really kind of beautiful. I'm a nerd, and I'm a scientist, so. Um, but I find it really beautiful and poetic, you know, like that, and I and I think that this is probably why um, this is still kind of a controversial thing. It's it's you know, it's uh, it's too beautiful really to be to be true. It's too egalitarian. All right, let's talk about how this happens. Let's talk about the process of evolution. So these are all members of the same species. These are brachia. These are all members of the same species. They're all dogs. All dogs go to heaven. But they look really different. Schnauzers look really different than huskies, which look really different than greyhounds and corgis with their short, fat little legs. Um, and German Shepherds, right, with their very broad, tall shoulders versus Basset Hounds, right? All different, but all the same species. These are all the same species. Corn. All the same species. In fact, the original corn looked like this. Just a tiny little, probably this big, um, little corn. Um, if you've ever been out in a, in, a, in a prairie field in the late fall, some of the grass, on the tips of the grass, it has little things that kind of look like this. That's all corn is. It's just a grass. And, but how did it get this big? How did dogs all look different like this? How did these all look different? That's what we're going to get to in a second. These, all members of the same species, pigeons, doves really, they're doves, right? You have the city pigeon, you have like beautiful doves, white doves, you have different types of doves. How? The question is, how the heck are these the same species? This too, all the same species, how? In the case of some of these, for example, the brachia, it's because of us, a process known as domestication. Domestication is the artificial selection of organisms based on different traits. So for example, for the brassica, oh sorry, brassica, not brachia, brassica, um, which is the, the, the ancient common ancestor for all brassica plants is wild mustard. Um, if any of you are from LA or live in LA, um, you'll, know, you'll notice wild mustard as the yellow thing that grows on all the hillsides basically around this time of year, March and April. Um, and it looks like this. If you go hiking or whatever, you'll see wild mustard. So wild mustard, brassica oleracea, became all of these through human domestication. For example, cabbage was selected for um, big, fat, juicy terminal leaf buds. So this is really just one big leaf. Cauliflower, this is all just one big flower. Broccoli is kind of a combination of flower buds and the stem itself that's being selected for. Kale, though, very different, is being selected for the leaves, not the flower. And kohlrabi is being selected for the stem. Humans, corn, same deal. Here's the that original corn. Here's corn today. Corn just kept being selected by um, uh, ancient Americans, ancient like uh, uh, people living in the Americas, like 10 between five and 10,000 years ago, for example, um, indigenous Americans selecting corn that had bigger and bigger seed pod, things like this. And so you eventually get to a corn that's really big and juicy that we eat. Um, same with dogs. Dogs all descended from a wolf, basically, um, or wild dogs, right? <laughs> and somehow this wolf became this poodle, um, this bulldog, uh, you know, all of these different, this, this, this thing. I don't know what kind of dog it is, but I love it. It's so cute. I want one. Um, and this is a process known as domestication. And what domestication is, is essentially humans simulating a natural process. 
a natural process which we know in nature we now call natural selection. Natural selection, which is basically, instead of, in this case, artificial selection, in natural selection, it's nature basically over time selecting for traits that are going to survive, that are going to make it, that are going to make them really likely to pass on their genes to a new generation. Here's an example of how species adapt, okay? So in this case, um, I've got one population of uh, zebra that, are, that look like zebra, right? And then I've got another population of zebra that don't look like zebra at all. Um, how did this happen? How did this population of zebra come to resemble zebra and this one come to resemble something else that doesn't look like zebra and we might even call a totally new species at this point? Well, it's through a process of adaptation to local conditions. So, here's the big tree. So originally, we have a population of striped zebra, um, but occasionally you'll get one zebra that um, has a, no stripes, that has just like a white coat. And occasionally you'll get a zebra that has no stripes but has a black coat, in this example, right? So most of the original population of zebra have the stripes, maybe one or two have these black coats, but just because a striped zebra mates with a white zebra doesn't mean that the offspring is going to be white or striped automatically. It can be either of the two based on how likely it is that this gene gets passed on versus this gene. And how likely it is depends on the environmental conditions. So for a long time, the environmental conditions allow for these striped zebras to persist um, with a few rare black or white zebras among them. But then over time, something happens, some event happens. Maybe the continents drift apart, or there's um, a volcanic eruption that separates these two populations. And this population is pushed out into um, a region that's snowy. Okay, So maybe they're on a continent, and the continent splits, and this continent stays near the equator, and this continent drifts up towards the North, North Pole, and over time, this continent is really snowy and, and, and the environment appears white often times. In this environment, it's better to be a white zebra than it is to be a striped zebra. It doesn't make sense to have stripes because everyone's going to see you and your predators are going to kill you before you have time to pass your striped genes on. So over time, it doesn't make sense to be striped here. That doesn't mean that you're not still going to have striped babies because that gene still exists in the population. It just means that those species with stri those um, individuals with stripes are less likely to survive in this environment. And so over time, their genes are going to become watered down. And what is eventually going to prevail is a white zebra, which is going to blend in with its white environment. However, in the population that stayed by the equator, this does not happen, okay? Despite the same genes being present at the beginning. So over time, natural selection has created a new species of white zebra. Does this make sense? Okay, I know maybe some of this is like retread for some of you who have spent time learning about evolution, but I just wanna make sure that we kind of get the, basic of, the basics of the science. So that same video that I showed you last week, um, there are more videos on it, which I encourage you to watch. Some of them are um, quite silly. So um, be really uh, careful when you watch it. I, I don't, I'm not going to show them in class. I feel like the video is really outdated and kind of sexist, honestly, and like weird and like Liam Neeson narrates it. And they interview all these like weird, creepy male biologists who are like, but it was like on PBS in like the early 2000s. So it just hasn't really like aged well. Um, and part of this is because, and we'll talk about this next week a little bit before we get into the global warming thing, is that um, there's like evolutionary psychology, which is psychology that kind of like draws from these themes of evolution and says like, 
goes one step further, for example, like in humans, right? It's like, um, you know, as we'll talk about next week, males in theory want to spread their seed and females want to like choose their mates, right? This is the common dichotomy that we're definitely going to talk a lot about. Joan Roughgarden talks a lot about in her talk. Um, but then this is used then to justify like sexual assault, right? Because it's like, oh, well, males can't help it. They just like have to spread their seed. And that's like really fucked up and like inappropriate. And so I don't really like showing this video because I think it borders on that. There's like just some creepy like stuff. But you're welcome to take a look if you want. Um, just like content warning. So some of the observations that um, that Darwin uh, arrived at, right, and helped him to sort of define and, and determine the principle of natural selection is that Individuals vary across the population, no matter what the environmental conditions are. Genes are not um, the same. Things can vary. Variations are heritable, which means that you can inherit them. You inherit them from your 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 parents or um, the species that that produced you. The the sorry, the individual that that produced you, that reproduced you. And this idea that struggle for existence defines natural selection. Struggle for existence is basically that. Organisms are always struggling in their environments. And certain trait variations will give certain individuals an advantage in surviving. And the longer you survive, the more you can reproduce and the more you can pass your specific genes on, which means the higher likelihood that your offspring and future generations of your offspring will look more like you if you survive. And you will survive if your traits are adapted to the environment. So it's not that over time, because it's snowy, zebras just turn white. It's that over time, white zebras survive in snowy environments more than striped zebras. And so therefore, they're more likely to pass their white genes on than the striped zebras are to pass their striped genes on. And so over time, you get a population that looks more like a white zebra than a striped zebra. That's natural selection. There's a fine, there's a kind of a subtle distinction um, between the two. It's different than like, um, I go to somewhere cold and I put a coat on, right? It's not like adapting in that way. It's adapting over generations to conditions, survivability. So those individuals with variations that confer an advantage will live longer, they'll have more offspring, and these variants will become more and more common in the environment over time. This is the principle of natural selection. And the next, uh, so that's, yeah, so that's the, the, uh, the end of that um, lecture on natural selection. The next section is, is, is sexual selection, kind of a refinement of the process. And so you could argue, and many people do, that sexual selection is just a form of natural selection. That species and organisms started having sex because it was advantageous for survival. That we have sex, at, that the reason we have sex is because of natural selection. That natural selection selected sex as the best way for many species to reproduce. Does that make sense, right? So so we have sex, well, we, like some species who have sex, um, presumably humans are those one of those species, um, because natural selection kind of determined that sex was the best way for us to do it, or the most advantageous way. Okay. Whew. Does anybody have any questions or thoughts or comments on evolution and natural selection. Okay, so it sucks because we're not in class together, but normally now I would have a really fun activity <laughs> for us to do where we separate beans by um, different methods, right? So there are like some small beans and some big beans and like maybe the environment is um, that only small beans or that small beans are more likely to 
survive. Um, and so you would see over iterations, like three or four generations, that you would end up with a group of beans that looked like the thing that you're naturally selecting for. Um, and so unfortunately we don't have that, but there is a um, computer simulator which you can kind of do this to, and I'm gonna find the link really quick. Okay. So, so here is um, a natural selection simulator, and I have, <laughs> And I'll post this link so that you all can play around with it. Um, but I've got a, a bunny here who is hopping around, a white bunny, okay? And I'm going to plot how many bunnies have white fur versus brown fur, okay? I'm going to choose brown fur to be the dominant trait on this bunny white fur to be the recessive trait, and I'm going to choose wolves as, um, as a one predator. And let's see what happens. Um, so I'm going to add a mate so that they can produce offsprings. Okay, so I've, I've added a mate. Oh, here come the wolves. Oh no, all the bunnies died. Dang. <laughs> Let me start over. <laughs> Maybe I should add a mate first. Let's go through one generation so that we get some, some babies before we introduce the wolves. So you can follow this line here. Okay, so now we've gone through one generation and, and those two bunnies produced four offspring. Now let's add the wolves and let's see what happens. So the wolves come in and they gobble up some of the bunnies. Dang, there's only one bunny left. Um... I'm doing this wrong. So natural selection working a bit too well. I, that's right. Natural selection is like working too well here. But this see, this is why like we can um we can play around here. How do I reset it though? Reset. Okay, how about we don't do wolves and we just make it like winter? And let's say that wifer is oh no no no. Reset. Okay, it's winter, but brown fur is dominant. I'm going to add a mate, and I'm going to go. So these two white um, bunnies produce, OK, so in their first offspring, they produced one, two, three, four bunnies. But this time, one of them is brown. OK, now let's go again. And let's see what happens. Okay, this time, uh, there's more brown, right? But there's not as many as you might expect with brown being the dominant trait. You would think that with brown being the dominant trait, there'd be more brown. But because there's snow, right, the white bunnies are more likely to survive. Okay, now let's introduce the wolves. They come and gobble up all of the brown bunnies. Because you can see the brown bunnies in the snow. Now in the next generation, I got basically no brown bunnies. Okay, and then I go through again and the, the wolves eat a bunch of the bunnies and let's see what happens in the next. Okay, now I've got lots of white bunnies and basically no brown bunnies. There's snow and there's wolves which are eating the brown bunnies which are easy to see and so you can see how over time the bunnies are basically just all white, white bunnies. So I'll post this and y'all can play around with it and I would love for you to sort of Play around and do one scenario uh, that you choose and kind of get it right. And then um, in addition to the Joan Roughgarden uh, video for next week, I also would like for you to just write a little sentence or two about the scenario that you chose on that, on that link and, um, and tell me how the natural selection process played out. And we'll, we'll share some of these next week. Does anyone have questions?
Hopefully this is like kind of fun now. I feel like the course gets more fun now. Less abstract and more concrete. Now we're talking about real things like, but we see why it was so important for us to understand like uniformitarianism. You can't really understand evolution without really understanding that history and stuff like that. So, um, and when we talk about climate change, we're definitely going to talk about like confirmation bias and all of these other different things that we learned about in the beginning, which now are really important. And so I actually really feel like this is like a cool way that we do this course. It's really neat for me. Anyway, um, questions about evolution, questions about natural selection, questions about next week, anything. Okay, awesome. Then I will um, let you go. And I will see you guys next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.